Well, welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm John Donnelly. I'm a senior writer with Congressional Quarterly and Roll Call, and I'm chairman of the Press Club's Press Freedom Committee, which spearheads club efforts to promote transparency and protect press freedom. For more about the club and membership in it, I encourage you to visit our website at press.org. And happy Sunshine Week to everybody. Uh, as you know, every year, as probably most of you know, every year in mid-March, we celebrate James Madison's birthday by focusing on the importance of transparent government. You can learn more about that at sunshineweek.org. And before we get started, I have uh, one please and several thank yous. The please is turn off the volume on your phones so that we don't disturb uh, the event. And now the thank yous. I want to thank Rachel Oswald, Glenn Marcus, Lizette Garcia for their help on this event. And I want to give special thanks. She's probably outside the door here. And I don't know if she can hear me, but Ruth Muhammad, who has helped extraordinarily a great deal, not only on this event, but this is our fourth Sunshine Week event this week. It's been a great week. And she has been instrumental in that. And I hope she can hear my voice. Um, and uh, I also want to thank up front, our panelists and the organizations who have participated here, uh, whom you will meet in just a moment. They've made this possible. Tonight's program is titled Civil Liberties Dead Zone. Do First and Fourth Amendment Rights Not Apply at the Border? Our panel will examine cases of journalists and others who have been interrogated at the U.S. border by Department of Homeland Security officials including cases where travelers have had their electronic devices taken. These actions have been defended by some as a tool in the fight against crime and terrorism. But they have aroused concern that they violate civil liberties and could, in the case of journalists, jeopardize sensitive information, such as sources' identities. And to help guide our discussion tonight, we've turned to Mark Rotenberg, who is the president, executive director, and founder of EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, a group that focuses on privacy and civil liberties issues. Mr. Rotenberg teaches information privacy law at Georgetown Law Center, and he frequently testifies in Congress and files friend of the court briefs on emerging privacy issues. So ladies and gentlemen, to introduce and moderate our panel, I give you Mark Rotenberg of EPIC, and thanks. Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you all for being here tonight. We've got a great topic, a great panel. We're going to be talking about civil liberties in the dead zone at U.S. borders. I'm happy we're here, by the way, at the press club because I didn't see any metal detectors, any body scanners. This is a building that celebrates civil liberties, not even an ID check. Now, actually, that worried me a little bit, but um, I'm okay with it. I hope you are as well. Um, I wanted to tell you also and to thank the press committee for organizing this event. Our organization, uh, my organization, EPIC, has a particular interest in this issue because we spent several years actually litigating to get the x-ray body scanners out of U.S. airports. Uh, we felt that they were too intrusive, not effective. They raised some significant uh, health risks, and we actually succeeded. The backscatter x-ray devices were removed uh, from the U.S. airports. We have now millimeter wave, which is um, somewhat preferable. But the reason I wanted to share that story uh, with you tonight is because we're going to be talking about searches of cell phones and laptops, uh, which is significant and interesting and of real concern to journalists. But I want to tell you, if you want to have a fun moment as a litigator, you attach an exhibit in your motion concerning why airport body scanners should not be allowed in the US, and you give an unfiltered image to the court to consider. And I had the opportunity to do that. So you guys, I know this is, no, it wasn't a self-image actually, <laughs> not yet anyway. Um, and I know we're gonna be talking about intrusive searches, but you really haven't seen an intrusive search until you've seen what an airport body scanner can do. Uh, we're going to begin tonight, our, our first speaker, and we're going to go in order, and each of our speakers will speak for about five minutes or so, have uh, some questions, some uh, dialogue with you. But I think our, our first uh, speaker 
is particularly well suited to help us um, understand this problem. Um, as a journalist, as someone who's traveled a great deal around the world, as someone who understands the importance of privacy and also some of the new tools that are being uh, used to help protect privacy, uh, Frank Smythe is really on the front lines of this issue. And before we give the lawyers the opportunity to tell us what the law and the policy is, I thought maybe, and I know this is not in keeping with Washington, we'd have a little discussion about, about what the actual problem is. So Frank, um, you're here on behalf of journalists. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about uh, your perspectives? Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you, John, and Rachel, for making this happen. I'm honored to be with my colleagues. Uh, Mark, Steve, is, and uh, Nima. Um, this is not an issue that I necessarily expected, let's say, a year ago to ever be talking about, but circumstances have become such that I, uh, I run a hostile environment training and consulting firm, and I also advise the Committee to Protect Journalists, and it became apparent that there was a need to research this and blog about this, um, and I discovered a, a number of interesting things. One of the groups that has sort of first encountered problems at U.S. borders have been Canadian attorneys, speaking of attorneys. The Canadian Bar Association has something online giving guidance to Canadian attorneys crossing into the United States about their rights and what to expect and what some of their options are. The San Francisco-based Electronic uh, Freedom Foundation has also put out excellent guidelines for journalists and other travelers about what to expect at US borders. We've had a number of incidents that uh, so far Raise, starting to raise concerns about journalists, U.S. journalists crossing U.S. borders, journalists who are U.S. citizens. We recently had a national public radio reporter who was stopped coming back from a wedding in Canada, and the circumstances of that case raised whether or not she was stopped for reasons of her ethnicity or, her, uh, or perceived ethnicity of her and her group, and nonetheless, her journalistic activities also became a subject uh, of concern during her, that crossing and during the interrogations or interviews, depending on what you want to call it. A number of photographers associated with or cases that have been taken up by the National Press Photographer Association. U.S. photographers taking pictures in places like Canada have been stopped on the way back crossing U.S. borders. And the Laura Poitras, a freelance journalist now with the New York Times, who's also been working with Eric Snowden in, uh, uh, in terms of releasing some of the material that he brought out from the National Security Archive, I mean, I'm sorry, the National Security Agency, excuse me, <laughs> and also, which, which may, may later have ended up at the National Security Archive, and then also with Glenn Greenwald based, an American journalist based in Brazil. Laura Poitras started having problems crossing U.S. borders dating back to after she uh, put out a documentary that was critical of U.S. actions in Iraq. So it precedes, in many ways, the snowstorm of information about the National Security uh, Agency uh, surveillance that we're now aware of. For journalists, this raises a number of concerns, and there are apparently different laws in, in, for different parts of the United States due to different court rulings that our, our, our legal experts can address that, I, that I'm just barely aware of. But for a journalist, when you're crossing into the United States, even if you're a US citizen, how do you want to operate? Uh, one way to operate is to try and be the gray man, right? Just sort of blend in and go, maybe not even mention that you're a reporter unless you're asked, right? And keep, it, keep yourself, whatever you're doing, make yourself seem as as innocuous and non-threatening as possible. That can work, right? And that's one way to go. Another way to go would be to encrypt your entire hard drive, right? That's another way to go, it's encrypted. But then if you are asked if they want to see the hard drive and they can ask, is it encrypted? Or if, then they can, when they ask you for the password, if you do not provide the password, right? You're not legally obligated, as I understand, to provide the password, but then TSA, Homeland Security, can take your computer away and copy the hard drive. And what I know, I'm not a technologist, but I know from my technologist expert friends, anytime your computer is physically out of your sight, someone could have implanted spyware or malware into that computer, and you no longer should trust it. Right? So the problem is, if you have an encrypted drive, they might say, fine, we're going to copy it. You could also use a program called TrueCrypt, which I've used, which I must say, if you're not a technologist, is a very difficult program to use. But TrueCrypt allows you to encrypt a file and then hide it as something else. You could have a series of wedding, photo, a wedding videos that are really wedding videos, and you'd have another wedding video that for some reason doesn't open. It doesn't open because it's actually a vault for TrueCrypt, and you can hide your, your sensitive information in that vault. One of the questions that EFF raises and the issues that they point out is, if you lie when you're being interviewed by a US border control agent, 
about whether or not you have, you're using TrueCrypt, you could have problems. So EFF, which usually is, has quite clear guidance, in that case is quite ambiguous about what the guidance should be. And that, and that really, that struck in my mind, because that's not something I've, I'm necessarily used to. Another way to go through is to have your complete, computer completely stripped down. The kind of thing that we recommend journalists to do if they're going to nations like China. Go with a computer that has basically very little operating information on it, just what you need to operate it, has no actual data on it that's your own data. You're presuming that it may be compromised and you're just using it for travel. You give it back to the home office after you're done and then you go back to your main laptop. You could also go through US borders with that, but of course, and that's an attractive option in many ways, but it's also incredibly inconvenient. Right, we all have information on our computers we want to be able to access, so that's a problem. I think the, the challenge for journalists is to find the right balance. And that's about, for me, operational security. If we've learned one thing uh, in the past six months or year, it's that you, anything you presume was safe is probably not safe. And the, the threshold for what is safe is by any measure higher than it was before. So um, I would suggest that journalists presume that nothing that they put in any electronic form is ever going to be foolproof. So it doesn't mean you don't put anything down in electronic form, but think about where you're putting it. In the old days, I would take notes from a source. I would, I would use a, 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 some sort of nickname that would remind me of the source, right? Maybe the place where we, where we met or maybe something about them that you know, we talked about, if the band they liked or something that would remind me of that source is, and I would have the name of the source and the contact information somewhere else. So if somebody actually got the notebook, they would see that it's sensitive information, but they wouldn't be able to make the connection. I think it's the same thing with electronic data. You want to presume that the, the, the data could be breached, no matter what the data is. I would never presume that anything could be possibly be secure in this environment. And you want to set it up in a way that even if it's breached, it would take a tremendous amount of manpower and a tremendous amount of resources and a great deal of luck to be able to piece together the information that could jeopardize your work or those of your sources. That you're breaking it up in enough different forms. You're using things like when you communicate with sources, you can ping them. So Facebook, for example, is not a safe way to communicate, but it might be possible to use Facebook to ping somebody. Hey man, you wanna have Chinese food? Sure, right, you know, and you can have a meeting, right? Making a phone call that, hey, you know what, let's get together, right? So you're using different things because one thing that I've learned, at least from the difference between the Americans and some others, American intelligence tends to collect everything. And the challenge for American intelligence, they're not sure how to put it all together. They like to have all this, they, they feel comfortable having vast amounts of data. This is going back before, before the internet, right? Where other intelligence agencies like the Mossad or intelligence agencies that have been trained by the Israelis tend to be much more effective at getting zeroing in on the information they need, right? So either way, I think you have to think that, presume that whatever you put in electronic form may not be safe. So spread it out as much as possible. Think about your operational security. So if something is breached, it isn't necessarily the end. Your work isn't necessarily jeopardized, and your sources, more importantly, aren't necessarily at risk. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, we're going to come back during the questioning. I certainly want to ask Frank about some of the technical measures that, that journalists are using and also some of the very real threats that people face in some parts of the world in terms of accessing their laptops and cell phones. Uh, but first, we're very pleased to have Stephen Bradbury uh, with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Bradbury is a partner uh, with the firm Deckard, but I think more significant for our discussion is the former uh, head of the Office of, of Legal Counsel, which of course plays a critical role uh, within the government determining what the laws should be, how they should be interpreted. And I know you certainly spent a lot of time after 9-11 thinking about issues related to border security, and maybe you can give us your views of, of how the government sees this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So just like the uh, Snowden disclosures, this issue involving border searches is a real opportunity for a public discussion about basic constitutional principles, which is a very healthy thing I think to do, and doesn't get done nearly enough. The Department of Homeland Security on behalf of Customs and Border Protection put out a policy in August 2009 under Janet Napolitano, which is very direct and clear, and it says that 
uh, Customs and Border Protection will be able to search electronic devices of travelers coming into the U.S. at the border, which includes at airports, from international flights, for any reason or for no reason, with suspicion or even without any reasonable suspicion. And it can include, it's pretty clear from the policy, full forensic searches of laptops. They could be held for days. The policy has certain procedural protections and certain limitations and record keeping in certain circumstances. We can get into more details maybe in response to questions. It's important to know that this is not something that happens all the time. It doesn't happen with every traveler who comes in. In fact, it's pretty rare. There are more than a million visitors come through border protection points, search points at airports, et cetera, borders, in the U.S. every day, more than a million every day. And laptops, other electronic devices are searched very rarely. So you have a full forensic search, much less than one a day across the nation. For a quick search, like open up the laptop, turn it on, take a quick look at it. Yes, it's a laptop. These look like innocent personal files. Close it, give it back. That kind of search, that will happen maybe at the rate of five a day. So it's a very tiny uh, fraction. There's no distinction made uh, for purposes of whether there's reasonable suspicion requirement needed if the person is an attorney or if the person is a journalist. However, the policy does have some procedural, uh, at least an additional procedural hurdle. If it's an attorney who says, wait a minute, those files are privileged, attorney-client privileged, or if it's a journalist that says, those are my journalism files, the border agent is supposed to get approval from an assistant chief counsel for the agency. But it doesn't say it requires reasonable suspicion. Assume the lawyer thinks about whether the circumstances would look good if things were challenged later or what have you. But they don't have to disclose the basis for why they decided to search, et cetera. So what's the constitutional foundation for this? It's actually quite strong. The Supreme Court has been very clear and very consistent that there is something called the border search exception to the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment. It doesn't mean that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply at the border, but it does mean the border is a special zone where no warrant is required and no reasonable suspicion for a search because the sovereign authority of the United States is to protect the United States from persons or things coming in that may be unlawful, dangerous, et cetera. And so anybody coming into the U.S., whether U.S. citizen or foreign national, has the burden, the law is, has the burden of establishing that they have the right to enter. And they have the burden of establishing that anything they're carrying, they have the right to bring in. And the border agents, border protection, has authority to enforce a lot of laws that relate to what might be brought in. So child pornography is a big issue that comes up in these cases. Also, intellectual property violations, copyrighted material that's, that's uh, a violation. Uh, financial, evidence of financial transactions might be on a laptop, uh, money laundering, uh, et cetera. Terrorism-related communications, material support of terrorism. In the case of a, a Laura Poitras or, or a other journalists who might be working with someone like an Edward Snowden, there might be classified documents on the laptop that were taken in violation, the U.S. would say, of the Espionage Act. So there may be various reasons why uh, a laptop search or smartphone search or what have you would be relevant to their law enforcement uh, authorities. And the lower courts that have addressed the issue have consistently held that a routine search at the border doesn't require reasonable suspicion. Now, the Supreme Court's law on this hasn't directly addressed electronic devices, but the court has, again, consistently said that if it's a routine search, no reasonable suspicion is required. A non-routine search in the Supreme Court is, for example, a search that is, imposes a significant invasion on the personal dignity and privacy of an individual person. And so example of that is a Montoya de Hernandez case, which involved a search of a woman's alimentary canal. 
she was carrying balloons of cocaine in her alimentary canal, 88 of them, actually. In that case, the court said it did require reasonable suspicion, but they did have reasonable suspicion. But the Supreme Court has not applied that reasonable suspicion requirement to searches of personal property. And so, for example, in uh, the Montano case, you had a car and border security took the gasoline tank entirely apart and then put it all back together again. No reasonable suspicion, the court said, was required. Again, the lower courts on electronic devices have, have been consistent on that, that it's not a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's also not a violation of the First Amendment, and First Amendment arguments have been made by researchers and on behalf of journalists in a recent case in the Eastern District of New York. And the courts have said, no, we're not going to say that there's a special First Amendment immunity that any person like a journalist would have. That would impose too high a burden on the border patrol, border protection agents to try to determine what may or may not be First Amendment protected. So for example, obscenity is not First Amendment protected, but at what point would the agent think, well, this is obscenity, how would they know in advance? versus pornography that is protected, for example. So it's, uh, the courts have said there isn't a special immunity based on First Amendment considerations. I should say just before I sit down that the Ninth Circuit, as in many fields of law, is out of step with the rest of the courts of appeals on this. The Ninth Circuit recently in an en banc decision in the Cotterman case said that a full comprehensive forensic search of a laptop does require reasonable suspicion. But again, in that case, they held there was reasonable suspicion. But a full forensic search, not entirely clear what that would be. In that case, what the court said it involved was they took the laptop, they confiscated it, they copied the entire hard drive, and they applied sophisticated software that could read files that had been deleted, and they could decrypt files, et cetera. It's pretty clear that the Homeland Security uh, policy would be that no reasonable suspicion is required for such a forensic search of a laptop. But in the Ninth Circuit, as Frank suggested, I think they'd have to apply the Ninth Circuit's, the Ninth Circuit's rule. But the Ninth Circuit was clear that what it called a quick review of a laptop would not require any re even reasonable suspicion. And so that, again, would mean opening up the laptop, turning it on, even reading the files, even reading what's on it. I don't know how long, uh, how fast the agent has to read, uh, but I don't think that would constitute a forensic search. I think there's a, there's a concept that has to be taken, has to be copied, these special procedures and software have to apply. So anyway, that's the legal background. I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Nima. Well, I thank wanna you. thank you, Steve. I mean, Frank has, has given us some tech advice on how to protect files. Actually, I picked up from Steve some travel advice. I think I'm gonna route now through SFO and LAX, <laughs> take advantage of those better Fourth Amendment safeguards. So that was, that was very helpful. Okay, uh, Nima Gulani is with the um, ACLU here in the Washington, D.C. office. She works on a wide range of uh, issues for the organization, including uh, immigration matters, which are actually uh, central to the debate we're having tonight. So thank you so much for being with us, Nima. Um, thank you so much, and I'm, I'm really glad that we're here talking about um, not just this important issue, but also how it sits in the, the broader um, conversation we're having nationally about border and border security and resourcing um, and how that um, impacts some of our civil liberties. Um, I thought it would be helpful to just talk a little bit more um, about one, you know, what, what do the policies actually say? You know, Steve um, touched on, on some of those issues, but, um, you know, what are the limitations based on what the agency has put out in its own directives? Um, and two, within those policies, what questions remain unanswered? You know, technology um, is a fast-moving vehicle, and not all of the questions that have emerged with a lot of travelers and a lot of the examples we've seen are addressed by some of the directives that are the Department of Homeland Security has put out there. Um, and lastly, I really wanted to take this issue and, and put it in the, the broader context of um, our border security policies um, and some of the shifts that we've seen over the last decade or so. You know, 
And with regards to the first question, what can the government do? You know, this has been touched on, um, touched on by some of the earlier panelists, but the government asserts the authority to, with no suspicion whatsoever, stop any traveler, that includes international travelers as well as US citizens, and search their laptops, their electronic devices, their mobile devices, um, to determine what, and determine what information is on there. Um, but that's not really the end of it. Um, as was also mentioned, the government also asserts the authority through its directives um, with US Customs and Border Protection um, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement to seize that device, retain it, and conduct a further search. That could mean sending the device to the FBI. We've talked about encryption software um, and some other methods. You know, will those methods stand up to a more deep search um, conducted by other federal agencies? You know, that's a real question when we think about how far the government has extended its authority. Um, in cases where sensitive information is involved, you know, there aren't any limitations on what the government can do. There's procedural, um, potentially procedural protections in place. They have to talk to a supervisor. Um, but does that really offer um, a significant protection to journalists and to others who are traveling with sensitive information um, on their electronic devices? Um, I think another important element um, of these directives is that for any type of search or seizing of the devices, there are you know, recommended time frames, but there's no maximum time frame. There's no limitation that says you know, within two days or within five days, this device must be returned to the person who, um, who, who always owns it. Um, and those should raise significant red flags when we think about um, the impact on some of our, our liberties and the impact on, on certain professions, whether that's business, um, business owners who may have trade secrets or whether that's journalists who might be engaged in investigative reporting. And so given these policies and given where technology has been, there's also lots of gaps in the policies. You know, I know on my phone you can access my email, my bank account, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you might even be able to figure out where I've been, you know, through, through various applications. If I'm traveling and I'm crossing a border and I'm a U.S. citizen and I have a device, you know, what are the limitations with what Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement can access? Can they access information that's in the cloud that they can use my device to get at? Or are they really restricted to what's stored on the device? You know, certainly the experience, uh, experiences we've heard from other travelers who've had their laptop search indicate that the government does feel free to access this information that's not even stored on the device itself. Um, and as technology advances and we really expand the types of information and the amount of information we can access from these devices, I think these, these problems are going to be much more pronounced and the invasion on privacy is going to be much more pronounced. Um, a second issue that, that has come up with a lot of um, a lot of people who have been searched at the border is passwords. You know, passwords have become um, something that generally people use to protect their privacy, something, um, something that many people um, take advantage of. If a Customs and Border Protection officer asks you for your password, you know, what are the limitations with what the agency can do? You can refuse to give them your password, but what is the implication of that? Does that mean that you're then subjected to additional screening, additional um, detention? Does that mean that um, you may have to wait for, for hours longer. What, are, what, what rights does the individual retain um, when they try to take reasonable steps to protect information that, that is private? Um, and also, what are the limitations on the extent to which these searches can be conducted at the behest of another federal agency? You know, is there a risk that some of these searches can just become a vehicle to um, evade you're getting a warrant, you know, can, can another federal agency say, hey, border protection, this person, you might want to search their device. There's certainly been some reporting to suggest that um, that, that might be a practice, but the directives don't really offer um, clear limitations on what that um, collusion between federal agencies can be, um, which I think raises more concerns when we think about how broad the, the authority has been assumed with regards to electronic devices. Um, and just Quickly in closing, before you know, I turn it, turn it over to, to many of your questions, I think it is important for us to take this issue and put it in the broader context of our border policy. You know, for many people, I think the idea that your, your laptop or your phone can be searched without cause seems extreme. Um, but I think a lot of those same people would be very surprised to know that if you live 100 miles from the border, um, you can be stopped and your car can be searched without probable cause. 
Um, the government has assumed, you know, authority within 100 miles from the border. We're not even talking about the functional border anymore. Um, and within the same 100-mile zones, there's surveillance equipment, there's roving patrols, there's inspections, there's checkpoints. Um, and these are only technologies and these are um, only practices that, you know, may become even more, um, more advanced and more extreme as we, as we continue to invest resources in the border, um, as we continue to, to place, um, you know, a priority on national security, potentially at the expense of some of our liberties. Um, so I think it's an important conversation to have uh, as to how we balance, balance these different interests and what that means going forward as we, we see in certain reforms is continued emphasis on, on really um, expanding border enforcement without thinking about some of these other issues. Um, thank you so much. We're going to have some time for some questions. I wanted to begin, though, by asking um, the panel about some of the self-help measures that Frank was uh, describing. I recall it wasn't too long ago, a good friend of mine who's actually a general counsel to a very big U.S. corporation was telling me um, that his IT department would not let him travel to China uh, with a laptop unless it was clean. I mean, they would sort of give him a clean laptop and then he would travel and he would set up a VPN from his hotel and through the VPN in his hotel room he was able to communicate you know, with his corporate headquarters and he simply assumed that the laptop uh, was always vulnerable. And that's, I, I think, in fact, increasingly how many U.S. businesses traveling overseas, you know, see certain parts of the world. Uh, but then actually it struck me that a rather remarkable change has taken place in the last few years and that is that for many of us, we're actually less dependent on our laptops and more dependent on our cell phones, right? Because we're now carrying around all that information, that contact information. You know, we still email, but we also do a lot of texting now, and that's really not laptop-based, that's cell phone-based. It's not so easy to set up a clean cell phone and use it for any real purpose. And I guess I just wanted to begin by asking Frank and, and our other panel members at, at the practical level, and let's not even assume we're dealing with the thorny questions of what policies and laws should be in place in the U.S., but if we assume we were traveling to a country where we were genuinely concerned about the security of our electronic devices, what should we do? I would uh, do exactly what your IT department told you and go with a stripped down version of a computer so you can use it, but I would have uh, no hard, no, no, nothing stored there, no, uh, no contacts, no nothing, so whatever they get it was, would be meaningless and then you could reformat it later and not have a problem. Now the problem is that you might need some files to actually get some work done, right? So, you know, that's, that always sounds good in theory. Um, um, and, there's, and also, just to be clear, I am not a technologist. I struggle to understand technology. I struggle to learn from technologists who sometimes seem to speak a different language than I do, right, in terms of, in terms of speaking in code and other things. But I think the, the problem is that there's always a trade-off between security and convenience. And I think everybody's got to decide for themselves what is best for themselves. I don't think there's any magic solution. Um, and I think it's important to think about um, how you're going to go through without attracting attention, uh, depending on what border you're going through, right? If you're attracting attention, you're going to, you could get all sorts of heat and more things that I realize could happen now that could, now I know could happen that I didn't know could happen before, including the fact that they could actually need permission. I didn't know that, but I'm not sure that really matters. I'm not sure how hard that would be to get. And even if they could, they could, still, they could still copy the hard drive at U.S. borders. But these are problems that we've seen at other borders, going into other nations, right? Going back even before the digital age, I was always concerned would my notebooks be confiscated when I'm trying to leave the country. So the main thing is, is that um, there's no, you've got to figure it out for yourself, and you've got to be prepared that somebody's going to look at what you have. So the question is, how much information are they going to get? I think that's the best we can do. Well, Steve, what would you do if you were traveling to China? <laughs> well, we have the same guidance uh, that your friend has. And uh, I think, you know, Judge Corman in the Abador case, which was just decided in December, where he dismissed a claim challenging the Homeland Security policy. And the plaintiff there was a, not a journalist, but a, a <coughs> researcher who was coming back into the country and had pictures that he had taken in Lebanon of Hamas demonstrations and Hezbollah demonstrations. And he explained that he was researching Shiite groups 
and the agent got suspicious because the agent knew that Hamas is not a Shiite group. And uh, he apparently w was not quite forthcoming in terms of having a different passport than visas anyway. There, there was some indication that there was suspicion there, and they did a search. Um, and one of the things Judge Corman said in holding that there was no basis to challenge the, the search was that if this researcher, presumably he had, and his visas indicated he had traveled not only to Lebanon but to Syria and maybe Libya and other places, and Judge Corman pointed out the obvious, which is when journalists or researchers or anybody with these interests in protecting the privacy of their laptops, their smartphones, et cetera, cross those borders, or really almost any border other than ours, there is a much higher likelihood of a very invasive search, including of electronic uh, devices. And in the UK, for example, if folks are familiar with the UK, they are notoriously thorough, <laughs> and they have a very clear directive that says no suspicion required for electronic devices. So, so uh, in many respects, I think the US border is the least of the concerns uh, for traveling world traveling journalists. So, and Nima, what do you do if you travel to a country where there isn't an ACLU chapter? Do you have a, do you have a strategy? Can you tell anywhere where there's not an <laughs> ACLU chapter? Um, you know, I think, I would reiterate, I don't think that we can assume that any of that information can remain private. You know, if there's something as simple as, you know, you have a GPS in a phone, even if you do strip down a phone, if there's, if the government is able to, to take your phone and do a full forensic analysis, which not all countries have the capability to do, or certainly um, not all countries have a practice of doing, then even if I do strip down my phone, there's, they're very likely to have very personal information. Um, and so I don't know that there's a good answer um, to how you maintain your privacy and how you uh, maintain confidential information while you're crossing borders. Say yeah, sure. One more thing. Uh, I think Judge Corman's decision is uh, is uh, interesting. Uh, I certainly learned a lot from it. But another thing he he pointed out is that Dell Computer has advised people, you know, if you don't really need to travel with laptops, don't do it because there are 16,000 laptops a year le lo lost in airports in the United States versus the four or five hundred electronic devices that, according to Homeland Security, have been searched as part of these border searches. So, uh, and it seems like every time I'm in the airport, I hear over the loudspeaker, if you left an iPad at the so-and-so, or you left your they Kindle at the... They those Dell laptops purposefully, by the way. I don't know if you... I don't know if you've used a Dell laptop. I left mine behind, but... Um, so I will say, putting on my tack hat, about 20 years ago I was teaching journalists and human rights advocates how to use PGP, which is an encryption uh, technique for private communications. And I have thought over the years about you know, what I would do in this situation. So I'm going to give you all a little bit of advice. Um, first of all, most of the crypto stuff is extremely difficult to use on a regular basis. Um, and even if you do use it, it's not so hard to break. So the satisfaction you think you're getting is, is not really going to work out so well. If you're trying to get data information out of a country where you have a genuine concern of being searched at the border, I would advise trying to get it on a micro SD card. Those are the little cards that are used typically for storing photographs and memory extensions that fit in phones and laptops. And then you hide that somewhere well in your luggage or in your wallet or on your purse, and they're very difficult to detect. And um, no, I wouldn't go there, actually. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, there's a part of me which makes me think for the, and it's often true in these security scenarios, for the really serious bad guys, they probably just smile when they look at the search procedures because they know how easy they are to evade. And it's typically the people who are either, you know, innocent of everything or just not very good at their chosen profession who end up getting caught. But um, yeah, a micro SD card is probably a good way if you're trying to move digital data across um, hostile borders. But that actually takes me to my next question. Um, and maybe I'll start with Steve here, because I think he'll, he'll have some views on this. It's interesting to me 
that as we think about you know what might constitute probable cause or what might become a you know more persuasive basis for a court to permit a search um, increasingly it seems the fact that people have chosen to use encryption techniques might provide that basis and I know in the midst of the debates we're having right now about the NSA collection program and how we make determinations under 215 as to who is a you know, U.S. resident or non-resident, if the communication is encrypted under the Department of Justice guidance, you pretty much get to assume that the person is not a U.S. citizen and therefore there's less protection in place. So I guess my question is to Steve, do you think that's a sensible doctrine? If someone is trying to hide something, is that a greater reason to permit a search to occur than if they just leave the text out in the open? Mm. Well, um, it's not identified in the Department of Homeland Security policy, I don't think, as a factor that would support you know, reasonable suspicion. Right. And by the way, reasonable suspicion is considerably lower threshold than probable cause that a crime has been committed. So it doesn't take much, as the courts have emphasized, to satisfy reasonable suspicion. So that's not that much of a protection. I mean, um, but um, it has been a factor in, in some cases. So one of the Ninth Circuit cases involving child pornography uh, did involve encrypted Files and it's discussed in the background discussion of the of the case, but it's not identified in and of itself as a factor supporting uh, reasonable suspicion in that case. There were other but, factors. But, but should it be? I mean, I'm, I'm posing no, the question I don't, to you. No, I, I I don't think so. Just because uh, a lot of people are sensitive about their personal information and. Um, for the reasons Frank said, may have a personal policy and preference to try to protect it. And I don't think, I actually don't think the agencies or the courts would view that in and of itself as reasonable suspicion, a reasonable basis to suspect uh, that somebody is, uh, may, may be involved in a criminal uh, act. Um, but if somebody, there's a guy, um, uh, Nadim Kobesi, who's built something called CryptoCat, he's been stopped at U.S. borders and shaken down because, because the guy figured out who he was and then he made CryptoCat. So just the fact that he built this tool, which is, it's, it's, you know, there's been issues about the tool, but a tool that is oriented toward human rights activists in places like Syria, right? It gives the problem, as, as Niba and, and also what you've laid out, is that it gives individual border customs agents incredible right. discretion. That's so right. if they, this, you know, there might be some, in, like with Laura Poitras, clearly there seems to be a flag that went up and there was an order, well, whatever she's got, search it. But for others, agents have incredible discretion. And just by the fact that you, you know, we're encouraged to have for a pin code on our phone. Is that going to be used against us? We're, if we're using encryption and we're a journalist, is that going to be a problem? And what you're talking about, the other way, which is the stealth way, which I really appreciate, and coming from a lawyer is even interesting, right? You know. I will send you a bill afterwards. <laughs> right. But. But you know, if you're in a place like, uh, you know, I would put the SIM card in my wallet to say that, oh, that's where I always keep it. Did I not mention that before? Because if they see it, if they, somebody finds it and it's clearly hidden somewhere, you could have real problems, including at US borders. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're uh, I, you know, in Vietnam, China. And the other, the other issue I think is that, you know, yes, the, the US compared to a lot of other nations um, is nowhere near as intrusive. But we now have a level of surveillance and a level of intrusiveness combined with our capability. You know, Zimbabwe would like to have that level of intrusiveness, but they don't have that technological capability, Eritrea, other nations. But now when you think about nations that have the technological capability to gather information and also are incredibly intrusive, Russia, China, Great Britain, and the United States all come to mind. And the problem from a press freedom perspective is the revelations about the United States conducting all this incredible surveillance means that the, the ability to which you can use the United States as a beacon or an example of press freedom in the world has been greatly diminished. Where other nations can say, what are you talking about? Even the United States, even Great Britain engage in these policies. There's no such thing as civil liberties. 
And I think that's the problem. It's not just a problem for journalists in this country or, or civil liberties in this country. It has an, an, an export effect that I think is really detrimental. And that's true with the way journalists are treated in general, but, but crossing U.S. borders, it becomes particularly problematic. That's a whole other topic, I'm staying. I'm staying. <laughs> uh, which I'd be happy to talk about. Um, uh, on the discretion of border protection agents, I just don't think th there's any way around the fact that with the high volume of people they see coming across the border, they have to have very broad discretion, and they have to be able to act on a hunch. Uh, it was a hunch uh, that uh, led the border patrol or border protection agent up in Washington state to stop the fellow who was on his way to LAX to bomb the airport. It was a pure hunch. There was no reasonable suspicion. It was just she just had a hunch. And they have to be able to operate uh, on that basis or the system really can't effectively work. And just one word on the, uh, on the Snowden comment, I think. Um, the reason that there is all of this debate about surveillance by the U.S. is because all, almost all of the documents that he disclosed related to surveillance by the U.S. I mean, there's a, a lot of surveillance by a lot of other countries that have not been the subject of any disclosures, mostly because we don't, they don't have any court system or any process of oversight. Uh, they don't even have the documents generated and available for anybody like him to see. Um, but I could that's, go on and on and on on that topic, as Mark yeah. knows. That, that's a good point. But please, let's not forget our friends at the GCHQ, who have also properly been recognized by Mr. Snowden for their contributions to world surveillance. <laughs> um, I'd like to go to Nima um, now at, at the ACLU and actually ask her what I think is kind of a tough question. I have another tough one for you, Steve. I hope it's a tough question. Um, but Nima, not everybody who's bringing uh, digital data across national borders is a crusading journalist uh, reporting on human rights abuses abroad. Uh, some of these people are actually engaging in the exchange of child pornography, and they have found that one of the best ways to do this is to physically transport the contraband uh, by means of laptop. And I was actually struck in the, in the Cotterman case, which is the case where the Ninth Circuit did seem to say that you need some reasonable suspicion. They didn't stop that fellow and look at his laptop until they had first made a determination that he was a registered sex offender, right? Now, I, I know the argument for why that is not an adequate basis to conduct a search of a person, but it is a bit of a reminder, sort of part of the background story of why it is that the DHS might be concerned about what people are bringing into the country on their laptops. How do you and the ACLU uh, deal with that reality? That there, there is a reality that that border security is important, um, and I, I think I wanted to wanted to touch on a point that was raised. This idea that you know an individual border patrol officer needs to have discretion to follow his hunches. Um, I think to cover maybe some of some of the cases you're alluding to, and I you know I just don't think that that's that's really true. I mean we've we've seen technology and surveillance being used in the most invasive ways. There's no reason why we can't use those same technologies to protect civil liberties. Why can't you get a warrant? You know, there are procedures in place that we use in our criminal justice system to protect against um, these very crimes. And so this idea that somehow just because you're, you're at the border that you should somehow be subject to, you know, less of a standard than you would be if you were committing the same offense, you know, 120 miles in from the border, I just don't think is true. And I don't think is reflective of, of the capabilities we really do have. You know, it's not, we're, it's not hard, as hard or as time consuming to get a warrant today as it was 50 years ago. You know, you can contact a judge via phone, you can contact a judge via, you know, a teleconference, you can contact a supervisor. And so it's I like think. It's like a quick and loan, practically, right? Exactly. Getting a warrant? Yeah. I mean, I can do anything in five minutes with my right. computer. Why not get a warrant? Well, it requires probable cause to get a warrant. So you have to have the probable cause first before you can get the warrant. The very first Congress of the United States, same Congress that approved the Fourth Amendment, passed a law that gave customs officers full discretion to do searches. So it goes back to the beginning of the country and it's consistent, I think, with the 
original understanding of what is a reasonable search under the Fourth Amendment. Although I might have to pull out Boyd versus U.S. on you there, Steve, that 1890 customs case finding that the search was impermissible as a violation of both the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Substantive due process. Well, I guess Lochner, Lochner era. There you go. Pre-Lochner, actually. Um, and that's what troubled Brandeis and Olmsted. So this is all going to be on the exam, by the way. But, <laughs> but, but before we get to the exam, let's have some questions. So please, yes, in the back. Uh, we've got a mic coming around. Just want to make sure. Is the NSA, you guys got a signal? OK, good. We're good, we're, we're good to go. OK. It, let's see. Is this working? OK. If you don't mind, let me, let me just take the chairman's prerogative and, and ask the first question. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Bradbury, um, to your knowledge, is there any kind of target list that the customs agents use? What Neiman was referring to. I mean, obviously, you've got a terrorism watch list. But what I'm wondering about in particular is uh, are national security reporters, for example, on a list? James Risen, if he crosses the border, let's look at his computer and maybe we'll learn a thing or two. To your knowledge, is that kind of thing going on at all? Well, not to my knowledge with respect to reporters. Okay. But I have, I don't know for sure, but I have little doubt that there will be lists of people that the border protection would be on the lookout for. I mean, that stands to, stands to reason, I think. And, uh, um, so, but not reporters, to your knowledge. No. Okay. Not, but. Okay. That's, just wanted to ask that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rafael De Janeiro. Thank you for a great panel. What about maritime borders? New York City is within 100 miles of the Atlantic Ocean, and most of the people in the United States live within 100 miles of those maritime borders. What does that do? Where do we really draw the lines? <clears throat> You brought up the 100. Sure. Um, <laughs> sure, I mean, um, the under outdated regulations, um, there's what we call this kind of constitution light zone, and that would include 100 miles from not just a land border, from a, but also from sea borders, um, something that includes, you know, roughly two-thirds of the population, um, nine out of ten major cities. I think functionally right now, the, the laptop searches, roving patrols, a lot of the um, the more invasive um, security procedures we're seeing um, tend to happen, you know, at the land borders, at, at international airports. But certainly that authority has been assumed within that entire 100-mile zone. Well, there, there is a doctrine called um, an extended border search where courts have required at least reasonable suspicion to do border-related searches. And that the, that would be within the 100 mile. The, the notion is an extended border search is where the circumstances suggest it's reasonable to think the person had already passed through border, a border check. And so you're not actually at the border uh, zone or at the border site. And so a higher standard is required. But just because New York City is within 100 miles of, of the, the border of the United States, I can't, I, this doctrine would not provide that anybody walking down the street in New York City could be searched with th these kinds of searches based solely on reasonable suspicion. I, I, I wouldn't accept that based on the ex extended border zone concept. It still has to be a border-related, customs-related uh, operation or search. And there has to be that nexus, I think. So I'll, I'll actually tell a personal story here, because I'm a sailor and a boater, and I've gone up and down the Potomac. And you'll get stopped sometimes by the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard wants to see if you've got all your safety gear and your flares and license and PFDs and so forth. But you can also get stopped by the DHS. The only thing the DHS is interested in is whether you have proper identification, which actually is kind of a funny stop on the water, because you could be sinking. But all they really need to know is if you're a US citizen who's properly there. It's a different world. Mark, go ahead and call on whoever you want. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, in the front. Hi, uh, Elaine Middleman, and I have to, I w 
Sorry to bother you, but I went to Michigan Law School, so I have to give a plug for <laughs> hoping they're winning the tournament right now. But anyway, thank you. Um, I have two questions that probably sound dumb, but one is these concepts you're talking about, are you making a distinction between journalists and other people like lawyers or just dumb people that are trying to cross the border? And my other question is, because I've done a lot of criminal appeals work, in the Fourth Amendment, there's exigent circumstances exception, which kind of swallows the Fourth Amendment, like, you know, flushing things down the toilet or whatever. Is there any similar exigent circumstances in this type of search? Well, it, this is the border search exception to the warrant requirement. So it applies at the border. They don't need probable cause. And certain non-routine searches, even at the border, require reasonable suspicion. But that's even lower than probable uh, probable cause. In terms of journalists versus others, there isn't a distinction under the Constitution. The courts have said, and I think if you think about it, it's, it's journalists uh, are not immune from being searched for potential involvement in criminal activities, for example, and they would they, they are not some shielded or immune conduit for contraband, for example, which they would otherwise become, potentially, if there were this recognized exception. But Homeland Security and its directive does make a distinction. And if you're a journalist and they want to search your electronic device and you say, wait a minute, I'm a journalist and I've got material on there, they are supposed to stop and go to a higher agent, officer, an assistant counsel for the agency to get approval before they do that. And if they do get the approval, they're supposed to have a record of this in their system. So there is some record keeping and there is some decision at a higher level made. But again, it doesn't specify that there has to be reasonable suspicion, but they at least recognize there will be issues there and they want to be more protective. So, then do you have so. A says, I'm a journalist badge? no, it's up to you to say if they if they want to take your laptop or search it. It's up to you to say, wait, I'm an attorney. There are attorney-client privilege materials on there, or I'm a journalist and I have my I, materials. I just want to jump in, Steve. I know Frank has a comment, and we should get to Frank next. But you know. Um, Greenwald's partner, uh, who was stopped at Heathrow for the search. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, that surely has to resonate in the journalism community for someone to have experienced that. Well, first of all, that's the UK, and I don't think they have any of these protective, as far as I know, procedures or distinctions. Number two, I think the uh, UK border agents had reason to believe that he was in possession of classified materials that relating to so that's GCHQ. Illegal, that's a legal predicate. Well, those would be con that would be the contraband. That would be like right. child pornography. If if somebody has classified documents that they are not authorized to have, that's a crime, and that's evidence of a crime. And so that would you know if they have reason to think he might have it, and I think in that case they pretty clearly did. That's, I think, was the basis for the, I mean, that would, that would support it here in the U.S., certainly, too. If I can just briefly, this is, I think, the issue that, that divides us, right? Classified materials could also mean classified information, just something somebody told you. And that becomes a justification or an excuse to be able to conduct a great deal of surveillance. And in the case of Laura Poitras, she got stopped repeatedly every time she came into the States after having done a documentary critical of the U.S. policies in Iraq. So that wasn't about, and it wasn't a documentary that revealed classified information from Dick Cheney's office. It was all Iraqi-based reporting, as I understand. So somebody up there, somehow there's a list and there, uh, th th of people on it that, that we're yeah. talking about, and the notion of classified information seems to be so broadly defined that it seems to cross the line into base, be anyone who's critical or some or forms of dissent, or at least it appears that that as could be the case in her case. As I understand it, in her case, uh, what she was concerned about was repeated questioning at the border and copying of her uh, credit cards and notes. So I don't know that there were electronic 
devices involved. But if you think about her, I don't know where she's coming from when she's coming into the country. Maybe she's coming from Iraq. Maybe she's coming from some of these countries. Was she affiliated with a major news organization or is she a freelance journalist? If, if you're a border protection agent, you don't know, let's just say you don't have a list, okay? And let's just say you don't know who the heck Laura Poitras is. But here's a person coming from Iraq who says, I'm a freelance journalist and I was just over there for three weeks, you know, traveling around because I'm doing some stories. You know, you might think, well, this is a person I'm going to question more and I'm going to look at some of the things and find out what the heck is she real? Because it's not like I was there on a business trip or I have family there. It's not obvious that it makes sense. So it's not terribly surprising. I'm kind of the freelance journalists. So. I was just going to say, I mean, I think this conversation really highlights the, the dangers and the tensions associated when you don't even need cause, right? It's irrelevant in some respects whether somebody had encrypted their material or where they were traveling. You know, irregardless if a Border Patrol officer knew nothing about that, they would be able to take her device, they would be able to question her, they would be able to, to you know, do a forensic analysis under the policies. Um, and when you rely and um, when you lower the level of cause and you lower the requirements so low, there's obviously going to be the danger that there's going to be these implications, you know, notwithstanding kind of the, the government collaboration that happens outside. Great. Sir, in the back. Hi, uh, Bob Schiff, and I'm a Michigan grad too. They're up 20 to 12. Uh, Six minutes left in the first half. Um, so two, two quick questions. One, you mentioned, uh, I guess there's been some disclosure of the number of searches, border searches of this kind that have been done, four or 500, you said, compared to the 16,000 lost laptops. Has any information been released on how many of those successfully identified illegal material? Um, be interesting to know whether all of this great discretion is actually stopping a lot of criminals or is just inconveniencing a lot of business people and, and journalists. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, and, you know, Department of Homeland Security is always very cautious about disclosing why they are doing certain things, why they are searching certain kinds of uh, containers or et cetera. Um, and what they found, unless there's going to be a prosecution from, you know, based on it, for example. Uh, so, you know, often when TSA at the airports changes their procedures, and we all get annoyed because now they're doing something a little differently than they did it two weeks ago, that may be because there's some threat reporting that suggests this is something they should look at. And they don't publish that. They don't make it public. And the same thing, I think, with when they have a reason to check things, they don't actually want to publicly disclose what the reason is. Right, but if they disclose that uh, <clears throat> of those 500 searches, 400 were actually revealed something of use, even if it was just that much, I'd feel more comfortable about this continuing than if it was only you know, 25, and the discretion, which you say is so necessary, uh, is being abused, essentially, or used for purposes that aren't succeeding. My second yeah. question um, <clears throat> is, I get that the Supreme Court, the courts uh, apparently have decided there's no protection, um, no Fourth Amendment protection for people at the borders in this particular circumstance. Um, they're comfortable with that based on whatever historical uh, reasons that, uh, you know, the, the borders were treated differently initially. But that doesn't mean that Congress can't decide that there should be more uh, protections for people. And I'm thinking particularly of American citizens. I mean. <clears throat> American business people, American journalists traveling overseas as part of their jobs to the benefit of, of the United States, its economy, and, 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 its, and our democracy, uh, seems to me ought to have more protection coming back into their own country than someone coming in from abroad who is not a citizen. And I wondered whether there's been discussion of that or whether there's legislation um, being considered. I know there was back. I think there was a legislative initiative that may have led to the policy actually being put out by DHS in 2009. Um, so, and so, interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, with regards to, um, to electronic device searches, there's been legislation introduced. There was um, fine gold legislation from several years ago. Representative Lofgren also had legislation that would have um, required a um, certain level of cause depending on, you know, whether you were doing an initial search of the device or um, a more um, invasive search. 
Um, since that time, I, you know, there's been certainly in um, congressional hearings, I think as recently as um, a couple months ago, where you, know, you really saw members on both sides of the aisle um, discuss you know, how concerning they, they've seen this sort of overreach at the border. Um, with regards to, I think, holistically addressing the border, I think that um, you know, members of Congress who are from those border regions, you know, I think Senator Leahy um, is a classic example, you know, who's at the northern border um, and I think has had experiences where you know, he was stopped at a checkpoint. Um, and they've you know, raised questions regarding you know, the, the overreach um, of these, these border searches, not just at the, the actual border, but 100 miles in. But in terms of actual legislation um, moving, um, it doesn't seem that there's been a, a great effort um, to, to limit some of those authorities. Yeah, um, I'll just speak briefly to this. I mean, both because it goes to the issues I did cover my privacy class, also because I worked uh, for Senator Leahy on updating the Federal Wiretap Act a number of years ago. Um, but both of your points are very important. Um, as I like to explain to my class, just because the court has made a decision about the scope of Fourth Amendment protection doesn't actually answer the question as to what the scope of privacy protection will be by statute. And we have many, many situations where Congress has decided with you know, financial records and uh, cable subscriber records and on and on it goes by statute to create privacy safeguards that have a Fourth Amendment-like standard. But your other point was a good one as well because if you look at the Federal Wiretap Act, for example, there's a very extensive reporting requirement. I mean, any prosecutor who gets a federal wiretap is going to have to report to the courts what the outcome was, what, you know, what the charges were, what the cost was, what the duration was, whether there were extensions. And the reason that this was done when electronic surveillance was first established was to give people some way to evaluate. Is this an effective technique? What's happening over time? How does one district compare with another district? So I think anything that can be done to give us more information about the effectiveness of this search technique uh, would be good, you know? I mean, and sometimes we don't find out for good reason, but I think the presumption should be disclosure. That's a Sunshine Week comment, by the way. Okay, next question. Her, here, sir. Hello, I'm John Hughes from Bloomberg. And I look at, I think about the possible solutions to this. And, you know, Congress, it's hard to get them to do pretty much anything these days, even pass a budget. So I wouldn't look there for, for change. Going to Homeland or, or trying to get the administration to change, I would think that would be a challenge. And then I think lawsuits, a judge. And I'm wondering if going forward, if there's any possibility of a decent court case coming down that could overturn this. And I think we have three organizations up here that have been good at suing people. And I'm wondering if any of you are thinking about getting in a lawsuit on this issue. Um, well, the ACLU has had um, several lawsuits uh, on this issue. They had the House case um, and the Abador case um, that was mentioned previously. Um, and so, you know, will continue to be engaged. Um, you know, in terms of um, precedent, there is the Cotterman case that, that says you need um, at least reasonable um, suspicion for, for more forensic analysis. So um, I think there might be some hope in the courts, but you know, I, I think that to, to really address these, the issues on a, on a broader scale, it might need congressional action or at least agency action. Well, the, the fact that the Ninth Circuit in the Cotterman case did require reasonable suspicion for the more extensive search. And if, if I'm correct that other courts of appeals won't go that way with respect to forensic searches, then you've got a conflict among courts of appeals, quite likely at a certain point that it will come up to the Supreme Court. You may not want that because the Supreme Court may decide it in favor of Homeland Security, but uh, at least that's the big kahuna, the Supreme Court decision. So I think that will probably come Right. one of these days because of the Ninth Circuit. Interestingly, there was uh, a cert to the Supreme Court, which was uh, turned down in January of this year from Cotterman. I will say, based on our experience with the airport body scanner issue, it takes a tremendous amount of time, work, effort, and creativity to, to get the outcome you desire. We started studying the airport body scanner issue in 2005. We did a series of Freedom of Information Act lawsuits. We obtained the technical specifications. We were able to determine 
that the devices were not effective, we twice petitioned Secretary Napolitano to begin a public rulemaking on the decision to deploy the airport body scanners for primary screening. Uh, we eventually uh, sued in the D.C. Circuit and actually won under an APA theory and then had to sue Napolitano three times in a mandamus action to get the agency to act on the decision of the D.C. Circuit. Simultaneously, there were legislative efforts in Congress and resolutions being passed by the European Parliament, national campaigns and front page reporting. So that's just in a nutshell on one border issue. And I think, by the way, it wasn't just about privacy. I mean, the devices actually don't work, um, which was also part of the practical consideration and the decision to have them removed. Um, but this is a hard one, you know. I mean, one of the issues we haven't even talked about tonight, again, going back into the history of some of these matters, is there was a time when people were concerned about what was on laptops, not simply because it might be images or contraband in, in the physical sense, but it also might have some functional capability and therefore pose a more direct national security threat to the nation. And we had that debate over encryption in the courts, I think, 20 years ago. So maybe we have time for one more uh, question. Yes, I know this woman here has been. Um, Thank you. Um, Deanne Divis, I would like to ask if you would please elaborate on this case, the Laura, I didn't quite catch the name, who was getting stopped repeatedly. You said that her notebooks and her credit cards were being copied. And then I'd like, I'd like to know more about that. It's not electronic. Also, what if they break your computer? I mean, if they damage your data, if they break your devices, then what? You know, if you're, if you're a company coming back with key research, if you're you know, a journalist with notes, of course, close to my heart, but you know, you got a million dollars worth of research on your laptop and they hit return and erase it by accident, then what? The Poitras case was just what I had heard, um, actually from Rachel, uh, as the facts there. I don't think it's a case in the sense that there was any legal challenge uh, to it, just the, the facts as she has reported them of her uh, re repeated encounters. Um, I, think if, I think if your property is damaged by a federal officer, you can get compensation for that. It may not be... Uh, you know, true compensation of lost intangible value. But they do have, in their directive, in their rules, they do have protections for chain of custody and safekeeping of materials. I think what they typically do with laptops and devices is they copy the hard drive and then work on the copy. And that's, I think, what the preference is in their procedures. And then if they're not going to use it, if it's not evidence of a crime, they're supposed to destroy it, the copy, and give you your property back. But it may be several days. It may be, in fact, they talk about up to 30 days of holding a device, for example, if they're doing a forensic uh, analysis of it. Is there any proof that they destroyed it? There's no proof they copied it, so how we, we don't, they don't admit they copied it, so we can't, they couldn't verify to us that they've destroyed it or to you, right? Yeah. And Poitras is somebody who had made a documentary critical of U.S. policy in Iraq and then was stopped dozens of times, not always necessarily a forensic investigation, but stopped and interviewed or interrogated, depending on how you look at it, repeatedly, and there was no evidence of any crime, including even possibly classified information or it seems like it would be a stretch to make that argument. It was her, it was her documentary that was critical of U.S. military actions on the ground in Iraq that seemed to be the reason, but every time she came into the States and she would fly in and out frequently, she was subjected to uh, extensive, uh, an extensive review or uh, interview or interrogation. And it just raises the question about what it takes, why her, and what it takes to get on that list and what the criteria is. I just, right. while we're talking about this, I just Googled this. This is a Salon article. Uh, uh, they talked to Poitras. She said since 2006, She's been stopped, and, and this includes before the whole Snowden thing. She'd been stopped 40 times. They would wait for her on the tarmac and figure out which one was her. So they were clearly looking for her. Um, and she has had her laptop, camera, and cell phone seized and not returned for weeks. So that was... Uh, we, have, we have time, I think, for some more questions. I wanted, 
and, I'll, and I will get to you. I wanted to put in just a little bit more backdrop on this issue, um, which is that I also um, know fairly well Bruce Schneier, and Bruce has been working uh, with Portress and, and Greenwald and, and Bart Gelman and Ashkan Sultani and others uh, to enable the distribution of some of the documents. And, and Bruce, who's a world-class cryptographer, um, has said that none of these techniques are perfect, but he nonetheless favors journalists using encryption because, in his words, it turns surveillance from a wholesale enterprise into a retail enterprise. It raises the cost of, of intercepting communication. So if Bruce were here, I think that's what he would say. I didn't want to suggest otherwise in, our, in my earlier comment. Um, I think to you, you had a question, yes? Okay. Uh, I, do, I don't mean to be intrusive, but and in full disclosure, Stephen Bradbury and I have been friends since we were at law school together in uh, Michigan uh, over 25 years ago. And I don't think... I beg your pardon? No, and, well, there's a but coming. I don't think we've ever agreed on anything political. <laughs> um, however, I think we respect each other's positions. And I just want to make sure that you're, because you're in a, an environment where um, probably your position is not the most favored. And I feel it necessary for you to explain why your perception, because a lot of these are literally shades of gray about facts and where we fall. Because I think as I'm listening to this dialogue, and truth is I agree with the other three people on the panel much more than I agree with you, sweetie. And we went to um, law school together. I, we went to law school together. But as he knows, I worked for the Democratic Party for years. Um, I'm Glenn Marcus's wife, which is probably an indictment. <laughs> um, um, this is all on tape. I, I, I realize that. No, but my point is, I don't think you've been given um, ready access to explain the nuances in why the differences in facts address a difference in kind, because I actually don't think that you and I disagree on all that much in terms of policy, but we disagree on where the facts fall. And also, just to defend myself, I'm a former federal prosecutor, as Steve knows, and as my husband knows, and so I'm sort of a law and order Democrat, but I don't think that a whole lot of what you're defending is all that bad, and I apologize because my husband will probably divorce me. Well, I, let me say, I, the way I'm approaching this is to explain what I understand the legal principles to be that support this policy or the, on which it's based. Not necessarily defending the policy, although it does strike me as reasonable and it does strike me that it would be difficult to craft an effective alternative that would require some measurable level of suspicion before a border protection agent could ask you the next question or ask to look at something in, of your personal effects. And uh, it's been so consistently and traditionally recognized that with respect to personal effects, brought into the U.S. at the border, there must be unfettered discretion for agents to look inside those containers. That seems pretty reasonable, right? If somebody's got a black box and he's bringing it in to the, to the country, should you require reasonable suspicion, some specific particularized reason to look in that black box? No. So the, the, the concept here is that a laptop is another kind of black box. And you might say, well, but it can contain so much personal information. It's like a, a traveling little house with all your personal thoughts and records and information in it, all your papers and personal effects. But it could also have a bomb. It could also have cyber security 
things. It could have child pornography. It can have evidence of uh, other crimes, etc. cetera. Um, and so at a certain point, it's not a meaningful distinction. And that's really what, and then, then just think about the cop on the beat who has, uh, is walking down the street and is trying to keep order, and we have a reasonable suspicion requirement for Terry stops to do, you know, stop, and et cetera. And that makes sense. The border patrol agent is in a whole different category because he or she is at this little counter, and there's a constant stream of people coming through. They're seeing so many people so quickly. They have to make a snap judgment. And to require that there be reasonable suspicion behind a, a decision is, a, is really, in that context, a high burden that, c that could actually mean that a lot of people get through that otherwise would be stopped. Now, the, the alternative would be, and maybe the technology will reach this point, it's just everybody who comes through. is just automatically, everything is scanned all the electronics or everything. And, you know, it, it, it actually might not be very long before we're there. And that would present some very interesting issues versus this kind of random, rare, uh, hit or miss uh, uh, searches. Uh, Judge Corman, again, in the Abador case, said if it came to that and we actually searched everybody forensically when they came in, he would, he personally said he would require reasonable suspicion before doing that. I'm not sure, I'm not, that seems to me to be a hard distinction to make. What, what would be wrong with, if you can search some randomly, searching everybody consistently? Certainly there'd be no discrimination, there'd be no targeting. So I actually don't think it will be too many years before we'll be facing those kinds of issues. Actually, that is the issue we litigated in the airport body scanner case. It's a 2011 opinion in the D.C. Circuit, Epic versus DHS, and it touches on several of these points. Okay, um, yes, Rachel, to you, please. Hi. Um, so I was kind of one of the key, one of the people who came up with the idea for this event, and the reason I want to I want to say why I came up with the idea for this event, and then ask a question with a little context in front of it. Um, I had read about the Laura Poitras case um, in the last year, and then more recently, um, New York Times uh, war correspondent C.J. Chivers and a New York Times multimedia reporter who was traveling with him, they were, I believe, on their way to Syria, and they were stopped. And they were interviewed by um, DHS agents. It wasn't clear to me from the article released on that whether their laptops were um, examined, but what was clear to me was that they were stopped and interrogated at the border. And um, what with what I read from Laura Portraits before, I was beginning to worry that this was the beginning of a pattern of national security reporters being on a list, recognizing the Obama administration has um, taken a adversarial um, position sometimes when it comes to uh, national security reporting. Um, you know, there was a concern that this is a trend, you know, that this is something that while in the past uh, DHS, you know, had not been using um, this policy to um, get a, get around First Amendment protections, but now that we are seeing signs that they were, so that was why the committee agreed that we wanted to hold this event. So now for my question, and I want to put a little context in front of it, one of the things that became apparent um, in the findings, the White House um, report in the lieu of the Edward Snowden leaks was that the NSA had erred in enacting policies without doing a thorough examination of all of the impacts they could have on foreign policy, on the U.S. economy. They were just kind of putting policies in place because of the technology that they could, that they could and there was a national security argument in favor of it. My concern is that this is one of those other policies that's being put in place without a thorough understanding of all of the realms besides national security that could be impacted on this. For example, um, American economy, businesses, the practice of journalists that was examined. Um, what about the role that, you know, we have in the world? You know, if other countries, if we're trying to encourage other countries to improve, you know, their human rights practices and, and um, practices, um, you know, um, press freedom, 
it really, really hurts us when we do this, you know, and I think that's one of those greater issues that needs to be taken into account when you're making a national security argument, and it's hard to make the national security argument when DHS will not release information on the credible, um, you know, intelligence they've collected on active, you know, national security threats that they've been able to intercept through these border searches. I don't know, Nima, maybe, do you want to speak to that? I mean, I think that you highlight a really important issue. I mean, we, looking at all the things that border security impacts, right, our economy, every extra minute that you um, require someone to go through a port of entry is, you know, I think some of the studies have said it's basically the equivalent of having a Super Bowl um, in some cities. Um, the investment, right, over the last 10 years, we have twice as much border patrol um, Border Patrol officers, we have, you know, the, the amount of investment just in terms of dollars in, in these security apparatuses is substantial. Um, and I do think that we, we've rolled out this, these, security, um, these security procedures without really thinking about, you know, on balance, what makes sense for the country? You know, is it worth, is it worth the impact on the economy? Is it worth, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of um, travelers who might be U.S. citizens who are subjected to, to searches that, that don't yield anything? Um, and what's the impact on on people, you know, going about in their day-to-day -day business? You know, I spoke to um, a woman who lived within 100 miles of the border who had been stopped by Border Patrol officer, and she was a U.S. citizen, and she took her kids out of school because she didn't want to drive down that road every day. Um, and so I, I do think it's important um, to, to think about this holistically um, and whether it makes sense and whether we're sacrificing too much, um, you know, for security policies that, frankly, we don't even know actually accomplish what they are intended to accomplish. Okay. I think we're... Um, Can I make one okay, quick stay. suggestion yeah. in response, uh, Rachel? And uh, I, I don't work for the Department of Homeland Security, so I guess I can take liberties, but I am somewhat acquainted with the new Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, who I suspect would be very open to coming as a guest of the National Press Club and addressing these issues directly and giving reporters and journalists and the public some assurance about concerns over targeting of journalists because he's a pretty open pro-transparency guy and uh, has a lot of credibility I think and would be sensitive to these issues and would be very interested in I think addressing them so I don't know that I haven't talked to him about it <laughs> uh, so I can just take the liberty of suggesting okay, that. We have a very if, brief... If I may interject there, just for the record we did reach out to DHS to see if they wanted to send somebody here and they declined Okay. So, just so you know. All right. We're, we're, we're going to take two very brief comments because now we're past our deadline. So, and I know for reporters, you guys, deadlines key, right? So, okay, there we go. Yeah. Mike. I just want to follow up real quickly to uh, Stephen's black box analogy. I mean. But you really have to work, if, if there's a justification, you really have to work on this because nobody is saying that you can't examine a laptop to figure out if it's a bomb. You don't need to keep it for two weeks and copy the hard drive in order to determine if it's imminently dangerous. Evidence of a crime. I might have evidence of a crime on my cell phone right now, but I can't be stopped and asked, you know, have it taken and examined for that evidence on the street here. Why should it be any different because I'm coming back from overseas as an American citizen? Child pornography is, it seems to be the answer of, in a whole lot of kind of excesses of searches. And I, I get that, but you can obtain child pornography, I imagine, in a lot of places. Um, maybe there are some countries where it's more easily obtained um, and you ought to be uh, searched uh, on the border to see if you brought something back. But uh, that's not, I don't think, what's happening in terms of all the searches that are going on. So. I just, I just feel like there has to be a better justification offered than this is just like every other search that is done at the border of people who are coming back and have their luggage rummaged through. It's a different thing because there's so much personal and private information on our devices now. Well, I think Thanks. That, um, As I understand it, and then, you know, who knows how much confidence we can actually have in the statistics, but from what Homeland Security has said, uh, 
the number of laptops or electronic devices that actually go through that kind of search and are, and are confiscated and kept for days or weeks is fewer than 100 in a year out of the five to 600 million visitors who come through the US borders every, every year. So it's, and the, I just think the practical reality is, although they don't require it, it's probably the case in most or all of those circumstances that they believe they had reasonable suspicion. They had some reason to go through the trouble of that. But they don't want to have to disclose publicly what the reason is. And they maintain they don't need it. And I think as a legal matter, they're on solid ground, as I've explained. You may disagree. But I think the, re the reality is they're, they're not going to do this for the most part unless they have some, some reason, I think. OK, we have a quick comment in the back. Yes. I will try to make this really quick. But uh, I was actually returning to JFK one time, coming back from the Middle East from a little reporting event. And uh, I was actually stopped for additional questioning. He asked me about my computer, what was on it, and that kind of thing. And as you can probably tell, I'm one of those, what, edgy, journal edgy freelancers that you talked about. Um, <laughs> And uh, this was after waiting two hours in the immigration line, particularly bad day, waiting for another 45 minutes for this special screening. They never gave me a good reason. Uh, the the, the Q&A was actually fairly short, maybe 20 minutes, I, if that's short. Uh, now, the only thing I could think of was that they, you know, somewhere along the lines, I had been tracked or ended up on some list. And I guess I have a question mostly for Nina. Is there, I'd really like to know, you know, like how exactly they pulled me out of the hat. I mean, I was, I did go, I was in the, uh, Occupied West Bank. I was flying back from Cairo. Um, they, uh, you know, obviously the is Israelis knew where I was. Um, at one point, I saw when I was in the Occupied West Bank, a member of the Israeli army taking photographs of me. Um, but I mean, I'm just kind of curious: is there a way to FOIA that or something to find out, like, how, why, like, I'm being pulled out for extra screening? And they knew it wasn't a matter of them just looking and saying, "Oh, yeah, well, you came from Egypt," because they said, "Oh, it's in in the system here." that you're being requested for extra screening. So at some point, whether before I got on so, the flight or while I was on the flight. I mean, there's not really a great way to get that information. I mean, there's a traveler redress um, system through TSA. But in our experience, when um, people file complaints and, and raise a lot of the same issues asking, you know, why they were stopped, especially for people who were stopped multiple times, um, you know, the response might be a form letter and a redress number. Um, so there's not really a great way to get that information, at least in my experience. Well, I was, I was going to give a slightly different answer, which is also how I was, I was going to conclude first by, and I think, John, did you have comments at the end? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay, so, so uh, I mean, first of all, it's been a really good discussion, I think a really informative discussion and a really helpful discussion, and I very much wanted to thank the panelists uh, for their contributions and thank you all also for your very good questions. But as the discussion continued, and your comment at the end really made this point to me very clearly. I kind of reached a conclusion that on behalf of Epic, I'm prepared to make an offer that I didn't even think of. I didn't even think of when I walked into this room. Uh, but just in very brief, um, we do a lot of Freedom of Information Act litigation. Um, I teach in this area. I publish books on this. And we're looking uh, for new uh, work related to border and privacy issues, and I'm simply going to offer to the Freedom of the Press Committee and other associated organizations, if you are a US journalist who believes you were stopped at the border and had a device searched uh, because you are a journalist, EPIC will work with you to file both Freedom of Information Act requests and Privacy Act requests to try to determine the basis uh, for that search. We won't represent you beyond any issue except what I've just described. But I'm actually quite interested in pursuing this. And we'll talk to Rachel and others about how to make that possible. So you, you've taught me something, and we have a new project. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to thank you all very much for coming and thank our panel. Let's give them a round of applause. And the president of the National Press Club, Myron Belkind, would like to take us out, as they say. Thank you. I'm honored to be president of the National Press Club this year. I'm honored because I have the distinct privilege of leading an organization of more than 3,000 members 
And the hardest part of a presidency is to plan the year, is to name your committee chairs, or to reappoint your committee chairs. And I have to say, after I knew it in advance, but this Sunshine Week's activities have been so excellent for the National Press Club, and it really is our most important mission to protect and preserve and do everything we can to enhance the efforts to protect freedom of the press. Um, when I was planning our year, I was greatly relieved that John Donnelly agreed to be the chair of the Freedom of the Press Committee. I would like to acknowledge him, and could the other members of the committee uh, please stand? I know we have several here tonight. Rachel, Glenn, I think there's a few others. Yeah. On behalf of the board, on behalf of our 3,000 members, I thank you and I thank the outstanding panel we had tonight to conclude an immensely successful Sunshine Week. John, if you're president next year, I don't mind if you want to expand it. It's, uh, I, was, I think there's a rule that a committee shouldn't have more than three events in a week. John said, could we break that rule for a fourth one? Break it as many times as you want for the programs you do. Thank you all, and thank you. Thank you.